you know, we started, mm. we started a marketing agency in a pandemic. And what's the mm. first thing that everybody turns off when the world goes upside down? Marketing. Mm. For yeah. me, given where we're currently at now and, you know, halfway through 2021 in the middle of a climate crisis, it's about, it's not even just doing the right thing anymore. It's about, mm. well, do you even want to have a viable long-term business on your hands? So I would say 100% your starting point should be publishing your own posts on your own social media channels and really building up your personal brand because that will be the differentiator mm -hmm. when you start applying for jobs between you and the other candidates. Hey, this is Shwada Dan and welcome back to another amazing episode of The Glamour Show. We are back again with another powerful conversation. Our guests today are Russ and Tim, the founders of Every and Brown, a digital marketing agency that puts people and planet on par with profit. <laughs> Welcome to the Climate for Show, Russ and Tim. Like, I'm so excited to have you guys here today. And, you know, like, we'll actually begin with you guys have to introduce yourself in a way that you've never done it before. <laughs> okay. For me? Oh. That's the Come way Come on. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you first. Oh, me first. Yeah, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Brown. Um, I've been coloring in for the last 18 years uh, as a creative um in the in the in the sort of digital creative space um for many many b2b brands um and still got passion for it absolutely love it yay that's now you're done <laughs> so hi everyone my name is russ avery and uh i've been writing words and doing other various creative things <laughs> for uh a similar length of time now but um only well, not only, but 11 years in sustainability, oh, wow. uh, nine of which have been in marketing for sustainable brands and businesses. Uh, and again, for a whole range of different, uh, primarily B2B brands. Yeah. That's amazing. And you know, guys, today, let's get a bit nostalgic. Let's actually go back to the time when you guys were actually planning out every and brown. Because you know, I do realize that you both would have had your individual journeys on a personal level. So you, you both would have had your own set of fears, own set of challenges, own set of circumstances. So let's really get back to that time. And let's normalize this phase of entrepreneurship where we are all in the figuring out phase. Uh, so, like, take me uh, through that time when you guys were just planning out every and round. What was the idea and what, what what was that time like? It was uh, exciting. Yeah, It all absolutely. happened very quickly. So, um, I'll interrupt me whenever because, mm. you know, I go off and one. Yeah. <laughs> so, we, we, Tim and I both had our own businesses. Um, so, Tim was a freelance uh, graphic designer and digital creative doing loads of stuff for lots of different local businesses in the area um and i was doing exactly what we're doing now but on my own as russ avery consulting um and we met in january 2019 at a local networking event which we now both run together as well and we we hit it off really quickly we just got on really well liked the same kind of stuff uh very quickly we started working together and i started using tim to help me fulfill uh, work for my clients uh, from a graphic design point of view uh, uh, and from there it just happened very organically and naturally yeah. we really enjoyed working together and it was only about uh, well less than a year later I guess when we decided to that we wanted to go to the next level and make it formal and uh, stop what we were both doing individually and join forces officially as Avery and Brown. I'm sure I've missed out a lot, so Tim, Tim can fill in the gaps. <laughs> Which, you know, actually was only 12 months ago. We incorporated the business in August, uh, August the 11th last year, so we're nearly at one years old, and it's been, it's been a really fast-paced, big learning curve journey um, for us to, to get where we are today, and we've got plans on hiring our first person in the next, next couple of weeks, which would be fantastic to have a full-time Avery and Brown person to come in and help us shape the brand and right. business and everything that we're doing for our clients. So I think you pretty much captured most stuff there. Yeah. Tim, how engulfed were you in sustainability like during the time that you joined basically Russ? Like were you also walking into sustainability and the space? One of my one of my first clients working on my own was a company called Green Wallet and they're a fintech uh, company and um, I did the branding and the design, the creative, uh, working with their team. And actually, that was my first 
take into that kind of uh, that kind of sustainability world, and uh, they are very much pushing vegan products, very much pushing uh, working with B Corps, etc. So that was really a full immersion into having to create a brand within that space. Beforehand, I've you know we live we try to live sustainably as a as a family uh, and, and all that sort of good stuff. But from a, a creative business point of view, it was very I was very late on in my business journey before I started doing any work. I mean, I used to do some work for some pretty terrible brands uh, that aren't that great for the planet and who shan't be named. Um, but it's 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 nice to be able to now focus on something which is making a difference. But Would this, you this guy right here has really shaped my uh, my thinking in uh, in how we can help some of these brands. Yeah, I was about to say that that you can say that Russ's passion for sustainability actually infected you. Absolutely, absolutely. And good we'll job, Raz. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> you know, and, and one of the first projects that we worked on was uh, another joint project, which was Renewability, which was our um, sustainable ethical and fashion label. I've got um, one of my t-shirts on which, today. <laughs> Coincidentally. And you know that was fantastic because it actually opened my eyes into the world of the world of sustainable fashion, how terrible fashion the, the fashion industry actually is. Um, and actually, if you can, uh, if you can, or you do make clothes, then you really need to look into a much more sustainable way of doing that. Uh, and that was really interesting. So that was that started to sort of, you know, swell my passion for for working in this sector. That's amazing, and thank you for like you know choosing sustainability. The world needs you and your unique contribution. <laughs> So, like, Russ, you tell me that because you have been into the space for quite a long, like, what was your starting point? And when did you decide, Ki, let's do something into sustainable marketing? Um, so, my starting point was in uh, 2009 when I'd been graduated for two years from university. I'd done various different uh, temporary jobs, none of which had really floated my boat at all. So in 2009, I went back to university to do a certificate in natural and environmental sciences with the Open University. And while I was doing that, I got my first job in sustainability, which was working for a small um, ocean conservation charity called SeaWeb. Um, and I was at SeaWeb for about two years, uh, which was brilliant. It was such a good place to work and such a great starting point uh, for my career in sustainability. Um, and it was while I was there that I discovered uh, social media and like blogging and stuff like that. So that's how I got into into marketing. Um, and then I did lots of marketing courses and lots of just self-taught stuff, read lots of books, uh, really got into it. And then for my two jobs after that, I was the in-house marketer for uh, B2B corporate sustainability consultancies, uh, where I was for, I guess, six years in total. Um, and then uh, that that kind of growth journey and stuff was just so fast and really quick, and it was great to be part of two two small startups which grew really quickly in the B two B corporate sustainability space in London. And then uh, and then I decided to go it alone as a freelance marketer, yeah, and consultant for for sustainable brands. Um, so honestly, it was sustainability first, and then mm -hmm. marketing second for me. Yeah. I think that's amazing, right? Because I always feel that if you can incorporate your passion to sustainability, the kind of, you know, the work you will be doing can add meaning and purpose to your life. You'll be loving what you're doing. And every morning you just wake up with, a, you know, like with a passion to do something. And that kind of change would be revolutionary. Imagine like if 7.5 billion people all doing the same thing, incorporating sustainability into their passion, what kind of amazing revolution it would be. Absolutely. And, you know, I know that we don't have... Uh... 7.5 billion people doing it yet but at least we're starting to see a bit of a snowball effect yes. on the number of um, businesses who are looking to do the right thing not just because they have mm -hmm. to for compliance reasons but because they want to so the input number of businesses becoming b corporations and uh and then similarly the number of individuals who are either looking to change tack and work for better companies or start their own sustainable startups like i've really felt like there's a there's been a bit of a step change in the last 18 yes. months so which is really great great to see yeah definitely 
So guys, like what has been your biggest, I would say, challenges or your biggest lows on this journey when you were like, when you felt like, why is it happening? And that did you had that kind of phase where everything was just, you didn't understand that why is it happening or what is it happening? And you just felt like, why am I doing this? Or felt like giving up. Did you had that phase in your journey with every and Brown? Today? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> we've, had, uh, we've had a bit of a challenging uh, a challenging day today but that's that's a joke answer it's not our it's yeah, not the it's actual not thing. serious answer um, mm-hmm. i think i what think in, well, i don't know really i think in all honesty it's been it's gone so quickly yeah you know the the the, the pandemic you know we started, mm-hmm. we started a marketing agency in a pandemic and what's the mm-hmm. first thing that everybody turns off when the world goes upside down marketing mm-hmm. Right. Um, so we were really, we worked really hard to build the business, to find the right clients. We had some clients that weren't in sustainability at the very mm-hmm. beginning, and we'll hold our hands up to that. Um, but they were, they were fundamental in helping us get the get the ball rolling. Um, but our roster of clients that we have now are all they all tick that box, and it's and it's brilliant. But in terms of big challenges, it was keeping the momentum. It was. Mm-hmm. It right. was it was making sure that what we were doing we could constantly believed mm-hmm. in, um, and making sure that the clients that we were attracting were, were had the same the same values and the same the same ethos, um, the same culture. So it was it's you know we're still very early in our journey, but I think it was keep just keeping the momentum and just keeping our keeping our head up above the water when it was a tough time to start a business. But you know we we worked really hard at it. Uh, works really hard at it so it's yeah i would say that for me that's probably my biggest challenge or has been our biggest challenge yeah yeah and i think we're i'd agree with tim and i think we're about to reach our second biggest challenge which is um a nice problem to have but we've just won some new clients in the last couple of weeks Mm. and we might be winning another big one in kind of mid-august we're just waiting to hear back on that Mm. and if we do we're going to need to scale the team quite quickly uh, to be able to fulfill all, all of that work. So that's going to be another kind of challenge in the growth of the business. And, you know, I think we're probably going to experience some natural growing pains over the next couple of months because, you know, neither Tim or I have ever, ever grown a business before. We've never employed people before. We've worked mm-hmm. with teams, but that's completely yeah. different to being the, the directors and owners of the company. So it's, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be an exciting rest of 2021 that's for sure yeah absolutely and it was <laughs> going to go by like that yeah which is even more scary <laughs> But I think like because you guys are together and the force that you carry with yourself is so powerful you'll be like you'll be actually on your road of making you know so many businesses sustainable inspiring so many people and that's the beauty of the road that you're going to walk ahead also yeah. like you guys tell me something that a lot of businesses actually trusting you with their you know labor of love i call it do you feel that like while planning campaigns for them or like while planning you know different kind of strategies for them is there sometimes a pressure on you guys and how do you guys actually deal with it oh I guess uh, it's all about the the order of um, stuff that we do, and like you know, having a really thorough approach. We we definitely don't feel we can do um, the best job that we can do for our clients unless we are able to do all the groundwork mm-hmm. at the beginning. Now, most people are really cool with that, and they know that we're we want to do our audits and our research on their market and their sector for a good reason. Some are a bit more hesitant, and I think the more skeptical like prospects or clients probably just think we're suggesting that to try and get more money out of them and to do more work for them. But the truth of the matter is simply that we can't do a good job for them by taking control of their communications yes. and what they're putting out there unless we feel like we know them really, really well mm. and their sector. Mm. That's why we do it. And I think you know the results then speak for themselves. When you look at the brands that we did do all that initial work for up front, like um, like Mesh Energy, for example, who mm-hmm. are our, one of our big clients, who are a, an independent renewable energy consultancy, so we did a good what three months of like groundwork before we yeah. really started doing yeah. the delivery. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and it's about getting fully embedded into their world, becoming an extension of their team, so that any member can come to us and we and we can talk to them 
um, you know, uh, vice versa, to really fully integrate ourselves into their world. Um, because then we can then talk their language, they understand how we can communicate with their customers to help them with their sales, to help them with their communications, um, and to help them tell their story. So, as Russ said, that groundwork is the most important part. And actually, it's some of the most exciting because we get to learn mm -hmm. loads more about a new sector, a new business, a new product, a new service, and, and so much more. So, yeah, it's, that's important for sure. And isn't it amazing? Like every day you're getting to know so many stories, you're getting to know so many whys, like why someone created that particular solution, what is, because you know, like when I talk to a lot of people, I have heard like a lot of, like everyone's why is different. And it just feels amazing the kind of, you know, I, I call it love, the kind of passion they have integrated into their business that they are creating. Yeah. Yeah, so like, is, yeah. Guys, tell me now that like uh, with sustainable businesses, how is a sustainable business different from any other business? And why should, for example, if I want to start something new, why should I look towards building a sustainable business and not like, you know, a regular business? Great question. So for me, given where we're currently at now and, you know, halfway through 2021 in the middle of a climate crisis, it's about it's not even just doing the right thing anymore. It's about, mm -hmm. well, do you even want to have a viable long-term business on your hands? Because if you do, then you're going to, it's going to need to be a sustainable business. Mm -hmm. I.e. one that one which can carry on, you know, uh, throughout the, throughout the next however many years into the future. That is the very definition of, um, you know, sustainable. But mm -hmm. now we, we are enjoying the conversation moving on from sustainable to regenerative. Yes. Whereby sustainable is now kind of almost too passive. If we listen to the climate uh, scientists, which of course we should, they think that lots of tipping points might have already been reached, and that you know mm. the world is, is you know things are going to get a lot lot worse before they get better. Like that is just facts now. So being a regenerative business is beyond sustainability. It's being a business which gives back more to society and the planet than what it takes from them. And uh, we now just think that is the only way to, to operate. Um, and it's, yeah, what gets us really excited, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think as well, you know, consumers are becoming more educated on the, the, the businesses and the companies that they're buying from. So more and more people are learning about B Corp. Um, more and more people are learning about different, the, the SDGs, for instance, and why businesses are focusing on, on supporting the, the, the 17 goals more and more consumers are understanding that actually they need to eat a little less meat, A, for health reasons, and B, to, to you know, you know help the planet, down. keep yeah. the emissions down, etc. More and more customers are looking into ways to buy electric vehicles. More and more customers are, 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 fi are finding ways and are understanding more and more about what sort of products and services they're buying and from who. So I think that's really important for businesses to start being way more transparent and actually to start focusing on providing much more sustainable solutions and to become a much more sustainable business. Um, but the regenerative uh, model is, is fascinating. Um, and, you know, when, 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 when Russ put that model together and we, we went through it, it was, again, another learning curve for me because, I, I, you know, I've not been as immersed in it. And it's, it's fascinating, it really is. Would and you, think, like, elaborate um, like more on regenerative model? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I'm not going to take, I'm not certainly not going to take any extra credit for having, like, invented something, because a lot of businesses... <laughs> yeah, have, when's the book coming? Yeah, we are exactly. happy to give you the credit, Raz. Take it. <laughs> I am not taking it. Let me just make that first. <laughs> so, a lot of businesses have been doing the kind of stuff that we're doing under the mm -hmm. banner of sustainability. Um, we now just want to see how far we can take it. So, some examples would be, um, like looking at our ESG criteria, so environmental, social and governance criteria and seeing like really how far we can take those things in terms of doing good. So, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like a, a regenerative business is one which gives back more to society and the planet than what it takes for them. Okay, so society. So how, how is Avery and Brown a good business for people, society, mm -hmm. uh, both locally and internationally? So we've got a whole list of different uh, ideas and criteria for what we can do there to support our local community. 
uh, local charities, but also um, international communities and, and charities. Uh, then you've got the environmental side of things. Um, uh, that's kind of easier in many ways because it's been more, I've been more immersed in that world. So, you know, it, we have just had our emissions measured so that we know what our own impact is um, at Avery and Brown, which uh, we'll be releasing soon. So for everyone listening to this now, you'll be able to find on our website our 2020 to 2021 <laughs> emissions. That's yeah, good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. We're probably in the future. I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've just had our emissions measured professionally by a sustainability consultancy, so they're all independently measured and verified. Um, and we know you have to know what your emissions are as a business so that you can work out how to reduce them. Because if you don't know what they are and where they come from, you can't have a realistic plan for, for reducing them and reaching uh, net zero targets, for example. So we've had that done, which for us, less than a year old, I think is probably very unusual for a business to have done that already. Uh, so that feels really good. Um, and as you'll see on our report on our website, our emissions are about seven tons of CO2 E per year, which is not very much. And we know how we can reduce them. But this year alone, we've already offset 60 tons. So we're already um, a carbon negative business, which feels really good um, before our one year anniversary. Um, governance stuff is interesting because we're going to be exploring that a lot more now that we're about to hire our first employee. So when we start building the team, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure we have really robust um, sets of uh, policies and procedures in place, uh, not only for our B Corp certification, which you have to have, but again, how far can we take it? Like, what can we do to make sure we are uh, a pioneer for uh employee handbooks and employee welfare and yeah. uh, packages like annual leave packages and health me mental health stuff um, yeah well we don't even know yet that's why no, I know yeah that's why yeah. I'm being a bit vague but yeah we're on that journey now and uh, the point is we've, we've we're thinking about all of these different areas yes. and we've got uh, a kind of mind map to follow and we've got a really great support network around us of um, advisors and consultants so yeah I saw your mind map and I think I'm just going to put that in the video, uh, the picture of the mind okay. map that you posted. Like it was like, I really love the kind of research and the kind of thoughts that you've put out on the mind map because like there were several points which when I thought about, I thought, okay, maybe I can do this too. Like, you know, so I really love the kind of pointers that you have put there. Also, Russ, you know, going back that you mentioned that you guys like figured out your emissions and ways to reduce the emissions. So being a, a marketing company, that's the way like I can define every in Brown. So what were your emissions? Like what were the sources of your emissions and what were the ways you have sort of like reduced them? Okay. Wow. You're really testing me now. <laughs> <laughs> so the main source of our emissions is our purchasing, I think. Mm -hmm. So we, so it's all scope three emissions. So we have no scope one and two. Ollie's going to kill me if I get any of this wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think we have no scope one and two emissions because we sublet our office off uh, Mesh who are upstairs above us. Mm -hmm. So that pushes everything downstream or upstream. I can't remember which way around it is. So all our emissions come from uh, our purchases. And then from me driving into the office, like in a small petrol car, one, uh, five, like five days a week, uh, so we've got immediate stats in our report um, mm -hmm. of how we can reduce that by buying from more sustainable suppliers, so having a really good procurement policy. Uh, and we do try and buy from B corporations already. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we try and buy from B corporations and or local businesses. Yeah. And for a couple of our suppliers, we've got a double whammy where they are local B Corps, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Um, like our coffee supplier, um, Amarmus Coffee, shout out, shout out for those guys. Um, and if I can start walking or cycling to the office a couple of, even just a couple of days a week, then that will have quite a significant in, impact on our emissions reductions over the course of a year. Um, and those are the main things, to yeah. be honest. And yeah. then, you know, our emissions as a business will jump significantly the minute we get our own office space. Yeah. Uh, but because we sublet at the moment, and there are only two of us, uh, it's not bad, but you know, we'll, we're on it from kind of almost day one effectively. Mm -hmm. So it now makes it really easy as we grow to kind of keep an eye on all this stuff. Tim, do you have something to add? 
not from the scope, uh, the, you know, the, the working out our emissions of the business and our impact of the business, but it was really interesting to do that exercise to get us to understand exactly what those numbers were. Right. Um, as Russ said, as we expand and we and we get uh, we get staff, you know, we're going to have to put that into consideration. What will their travel time be? And yeah. um, will they be working remotely? Um, you know, the supply of their IT and their office equipment. Um, we, we, you know, so so many different factors. And if we end up getting different offices that are our own, or we in the future we build our own offices, how do we how do we do that? Um, so it was really interesting to get. You know, I'm all about data, especially from the digital side. So it's really interesting to get that rounded understanding of where we are today, um, because what they say, what gets measured gets managed, right? They say that. So it's really interesting to see where we are today to be able to then grow and then keep that data managed and those numbers managed. So I would definitely recommend every business to um, to, to work out their 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 their, their impact. Um, because it would really, it would really be eye-opening into um, uh, how they might be able to make some changes. Really would. And there are various um, source of resources out there which all say that the starting point of your journey as a sustainable mm. business has to be in measuring your emissions, mm. because that's there are lots of different facets to obviously sustainability, like plastic-free right. and stuff like that. But actually, because of the state of the world, it's all about emissions right now. It's all about reducing emissions. So it's a really good starting point. You know, I think that's amazing. And one more door, I think it opens up that when, like, I love the way you guys were transparent and honest about the emissions and the way you said, okay, so this is the emissions, this is where they are going up and that is how we need to control it. So I think that dialogue is very important because that really, you know, like helps us to collaborate, helps us to help each other. And that way, I feel that a lot of times I hear this one thing from people, they're like, you know, they're very eco-anxious. That, okay, so much is happening. How should I do that? Am I even doing the right thing? Even like taking small steps. So I feel that dialogue is very important. It really helps us to move forward on the right path. And like, thank you guys for putting it forward. And thank you for being an example to so many people out there. Uh, it's our pleasure. And we're, you know, we will carry on sharing every single part of our journey, even if it's something really small. Like, yeah, we just, we let, we even let people know in our weekly updates if we've signed some petitions that week or something. Mm. Because why wouldn't we? If, if 10 more people sign that petition after seeing it from us, it's such a, an obvious thing to do, you know? No, definitely. So, guys, tell me something. Like, for example, say I have just graduated college. I love social media. I love marketing. And I really want to, you know, like help sustainable businesses grow. I really want to be in that uh, profession. So what should be my start? Particularly when I have no experience, I have zero clients. I have zero knowledge about sustainable businesses. So where should I start from? So I would say 100% your starting point should be publishing your own posts on your own social media channels and really building up your personal brand because that will be the differentiator mm -hmm. when you start applying for jobs between you and the other candidates. If you've got a really strong uh, social presence and you've uh, and your f potential future employer can see your amazing yeah. LinkedIn profile and all the posts that you've been putting out there or Twitter or in, even Instagram, whatever, uh, maybe you've even got your own website and your own blog where you're blogging about topics yourself to prove how passionate you are about it. Um, individually um mm. it, it's just such a, a major differentiator so that would be my advice is really focus on building up your personal brand Absolutely. tim what would you say um you know to be able to support some sustainable brands as well i would you know suggest uh maybe an app uh tree app um is a really great app to be able to do that so uh brands will um um present their brands to you and in return you, you get to plant a tree and mm -hmm. um, or they'll plant a tree in, in, on your behalf and so you can build up your little forests everywhere uh, and you get to see brand content and there's they use it obviously for some market research into what type of uh, product color you like out of, their, out of their product range for instance but it's a really nice way to then be introduced to a whole mm -hmm. series of different sustainable brands so there might be some cosmetics there might be some, there might be some um, sporting brands in there. There might be, you know, brands that are making trainers out of 
all sorts of great sustainable materials, for instance. So it gives you a really good insight into what some of those other brands are. You know, even in your local high street or your lo local supermarkets, have a look out for things like B Corps. Have a look out for um, refill sh stores to be able right. to reduce that side of things. Um, and that will start to give you uh, a much, I don't know, clearer understanding of how some of the stuff is all put together. Um, so the Tree app is a great way to start because it's super easy to sign up and you can get involved pretty, pretty easily. But there's plenty of, plenty of apps out there like that. Okay, uh, so you know, like you guys are here. I'm not letting you go. Uh, like before, we have some good business tips for sustainable businesses out there. So, like guys, tell me what is the one mistake that you have seen like most of the sustainable businesses make? Uh, wow, that's tricky. That's yeah, a tricky that question. Is hard. Yeah, um, I probably mean, from a from a communications perspective. Mm -hmm. Probably ones who succumb to the pressure of feeling like they need to be doing more than they already are. So mm -hmm. feeling like they need to elaborate more in their comms about what they're doing, i.e. greenwashing people. Because even, mm -hmm. so the problem is even a, mm -hmm. an actually sustainable business can end up using greenwash by accident, right. by feeling like they needed to communicate that they're doing more than they actually are, like by feeling that they're under pressure to do so. Whereas actually they need to remind themselves that consumers just really respect and admire authenticity and transparency and honesty uh, from brands. So if you're at the beginning of your sustainability journey and you've got a long way to go, say so, it's fine. Just say you're right at the start and that you yeah. want to be doing this, 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 and this, but at the mm -hmm. moment, right at the beginning but hopefully in a year's time you'll be here and then you'll be here uh just communicate that and tell people what your intentions are mm -hmm. um, but we don't i don't think we've worked with that many or, or many who have done that have we no so no. i don't know what the biggest mistake from our own clients would be for example maybe it's just about not being not being proud enough to tell their tell the story you know mm. it's, a lot of businesses start very very quickly and they and they grow relatively quickly and they sort of sometimes maybe forget it, why it is that they're doing what they're what they're doing and right. they get they get to that point where that exponential growth sort mm. of stops them from reminding themselves about their values and i think mm. when you take a step back and you can say well actually this is our story if you're starting a new business like russ says document your journey really go through it because that that will be your legacy that will be that will be why people will apply for jobs at your business that will be why people will buy your products and your services is being able to be completely transparent as you say so i think it's just about being focused on your storytelling and you know that is becoming a, a, a large large part of of how to communicate with your customers your stakeholders your uh, employees your board um, and, and people out on social media. So I think it's about really honing down that story for me. Yeah. Do you know, like, uh, like I can be completely wrong on this, you know, actually. Like, today, everyone, like, sometimes run behind followers. We want fast followers. We want, you know, if I say about podcast, uh, say someone wants, like, listeners to grow, like, in that snap seconds, be it subscribers, be it customers. Do you think that sometimes we put a lot of pressure on the time zone that it has to happen now? It has to happen now. And that also sort of uh, like hinders what we are actually trying to showcase to the world out there. That anxiety of just growing and all those things. Um, yeah, I think people definitely feel that pressure. And um... I mean, if we use like the size of your social media order, audience or mm -hmm. listener numbers as an example, um, people just need to remember that it's always much better to have a thousand diehard fans who mm -hmm. engage with everything you put out there than it is to have a hundred thousand who are just a number on a screen mm -hmm. who, don't, who don't comment or like or engage with any of your stuff. So um, it's the whole social one of the social dilemmas that everyone deals with but you know yeah it's feeling the pressure so that that yeah exactly and it's toxic right it's not mm. it's not the way to it's not the way to live it's not the way to build the business mm. you know like like russ says it's much better to have that small finite number of people who are fully immersed into what you're doing and totally believe you and support you 
than a much larger number who are just sat there consuming your content but not engaging, not purchasing, mm -hmm. not, not doing anything. Um, actually, and then you're in the danger of someone saying something negative about your brand mm. because it's not for them for whatever reason. So I think rushing to get those high figures is always going to be difficult because then your authenticity mm. is not in it um, because all you want is big numbers. And I think that's one of the biggest, like you say, social dilemmas that people uh, really fall really fall in the trap of, you know. And, you know, as a business, we have got a tiny social following. Yeah. You know, we've got like 600 likes on our company page on LinkedIn, about 300 Instagram followers and yeah. about 30 Twitter followers or something. But we still get really good results from the social content that we put out there. Yeah. We get we get direct inquiries from mm -hmm. prospects like on a almost weekly basis, I would say. Not all of them work out, sure, because of they might not have a budget or whatever, but the point is we get those inquiries from the content that we're putting out there. Mm. And we know that it's because it's a small but engaged audience. Yeah. Also, like, you know, like when a lot of businesses are actually bootstrapped and during because I heard this when I started out, like both of our companies are bootstrapped. So people told me that, you know, it's going to take a lot of money. And uh, so maybe not now you should wait for some time and all those things happen to me as well. So what do you think is the advantage that if I say we as businesses can uh, leverage of being bootstrapped or what are the things that we can do that does not require money, but requires effort, requires patience and requires that, you know, drive to do it. What are your little, I would say, hacks or advice for that? Publishing content. So yeah. like coming back to some of the previous things we've mentioned, so mm -hmm. Uh, regardless of what it is, whether it's to do with your sustainability journey or uh, blog posts around your actual expertise as a business, um, just publish content. Social media was an absolute game changer for the whole marketing world for the fact that it's essentially free. A free way to reach millions of people was unheard of before the internet and social media arrived. Yeah you would have to pay to reach your audience. Now, clever businesses and solopreneurs and freelancers can reach huge audiences and they haven't had to pay a single penny. And, and like you said, it's just taken their time and effort and elbow grease to, to do, you know? Mm. So yeah, any business, and, and of course, that's the reason why some brands are engaging us because they feel like they are now needing to play catch up and they haven't been doing a good enough job of that. So content uh, creation and content strategy and publication is um, yeah, quite a big thing that we do for our clients um, because they've kind of woken up to how, how effective that is from a marketing spend point of view. Also, guys, like clear this for me that uh, sometimes people say that uh, should be authentic on social media, be it with the type of content you're putting, like show what you actually believe in. And on the other side, sometimes we say that create what your audience wants. So like how to actually choose that which way to go? What is the demarcation between that? Well, you can, you can be authentic and still give your audience what they want to see from a certain point of view. You can be authentic because when you publish your posts that are more uh, behind the scenes posts or like cultural based posts, you should absolutely share something that went badly as well as all your successes. People love that. Yeah. Uh, something that went wrong, like uh, a real struggle that you went through, like the question you asked us earlier, like what our struggles were. Mm. Um, but then, you know, if we share a post that we think uh, people want to see based on some keyword research about something to do with marketing or design, we can still write that as a savvy digital marketing and creative agency who know what they're doing mm. to, to get views on our own content. It's only, you know, being inauthentic is only when you're lying or being inauthentic about those personal posts that you put out there, like, like the Instagram influencers who are sharing their their life when it's not actually their life at all and it's you know all um uh set up scenarios yeah. what's the word i'm looking for it's all fa completely it's fabricated, fabricated. Yeah. yeah yeah um but as a business owner it's actually really easy i think 
It's just that people get put off by it. Yeah. Because people get scared to put the real them out there because they think that they'll something bad will happen and they might get attacked and stuff. And um, you know, it's an element of truth to that. It, the more the bigger following that you get, the more trolls and negativity you will probably end up attracting. Mm, mm. But you it's just a, an unfortunate byproduct. Byproduct being of, honest, yeah. Of, of yeah, being honest and getting yeah. bigger on social media. They'll just come out of the, the woodwork, but you'll have to you just have to ignore them and remember how much positive and uh, yeah, positive energy and comments you're getting as well. So. But you know, these negative comments are actually great for your engagement because the more that people comment on your posts, the more people see it, and then more of your posts gets served up to them because the algorithm loves it. So it's just a vicious circle of just winding everybody up, which I find quite funny. It's like getting, yeah, like getting the um, the climate <laughs> deniers out in force. Like we we did a post for a client uh, the week before last, and. Uh, Every every climate skeptic and climate denier who was on LinkedIn ended up going into the comments and, and absolutely trying to destroy the post yeah. and everything that was said in it. But as a result, they helped that post get twenty thousand views or something. It's something and, ridiculous. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely crazy amount of comments and uh, so you've got reactions. to take. Yeah, you've got to. It, it plays its part, and you've got to take the rough with the smooth. I guess sometimes. Mm-hmm. No, that definitely is there. And I think you're right that we should use it like as a positive energy because, you know, there was this one person, like one other, uh, like social media, I could marketer, uh, who actually mentioned this thing that people have forgotten that social, the word social media is mainly to be social. Also, like, you know, towards the end, I'd like to ask you my last question. Give, like, tell me what do you like love about each other as a team member? So Russ about Tim and Tim about Russ. And that. also, also, oh, also, also that, uh, you know, like how has this bonding or how has this thing been your biggest strength or your support in running every end round? So my biggest thing, <laughs> the biggest thing I love about, yeah, yeah, I love about Tim <laughs> is just honestly, just the fact that there are two of us who get along really well because I was, you know, I was having a great time at Russ Avery Consulting. I loved working for myself. Mm. What are you yeah. laughing at? <laughs> I was having a great time until I met you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I was, uh, things were going really well. I had lots of clients and great work. But when you, now that I can look back after a year as well of, mm. of Avery and Brown, I can just honestly say it's just not as fun. It's The journey is just not as fun if you haven't got someone to share it with mm. when you're so aligned like we you know we would make you know we're going to have to be careful when we get our first employee because we have a terrible but very similar sense of humor <laughs> the same bad jokes we like the same bad movies and stuff like that so you know we we keep each other going if one of us is having a bad day and stuff mm. like that and yeah the the uh, a problem shared is a problem halved and all that kind of stuff you know yeah absolutely i think it's pretty similar I mean it was um, I was in I was when we first started this I never never knew that we would get to where we are today mm-hmm. and it still feel amazing it's been very quick to get to where we are and um, you can't do that if the other half of your business is you, you, you just you just don't get on or you you battle or you clash at every every turning point mm-hmm. and Russ and I are very similar in that way and so working together is great. And what's, what's, what's brilliant is what Russ brings to the table with his strategic marketing uh, and, and copywriting skills and passion for the sustainability sector is then matched and mirrored like a good connectivity, like a puzzle piece, where I can turn what he thinks and turn it into something which customers can touch and feel and engage with from a visual point of view. So actually, that, that, that side of the relationship is very natural. And then we are just, you know, same, same sense of humour, same bad <laughs> 80s movies and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and, yeah, it just is a, is a very good fit. It's a very good fit.
wow that's amazing like you know thank you guys thank you for this amazing combination thank you for doing what you do because you do not know that how many people you inspire and on your journey how many lives you are impacting so thank you so much for doing that like the planet truly really needs you and your unique contribution no thank you so much for having yeah. us Shreta. we really yeah. really appreciate it it's been uh, it's been a great chat absolutely absolutely thank you guys